let's get start started. So we're going to be talking about monitoring large language models um, in production, though some of what we're talking about can also really be used in the evaluation phase uh, before putting a model in production. And again, we're going to be using Hugging Face and Linkit, which um, are both open source libraries. Hugging Face is a big company and has a lot more going on, but we'll be using the Hugging Face Transformers library and uh, their UI library called Gradio. Um, quick agenda. So I'm going to do a quick introduction, um, set up again for anyone who came in, and then we'll talk about large language models and some pain points. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can use the open source library Linkit to help solve those problems and monitor for them. And then a lot of this hopefully will be the hands-on example. So again, there'll be a collab notebook. I'll be walking through it. You don't necessarily have to follow along, but I definitely recommend it. I think it's usually more fun uh, coming to an event workshop and actually running code and playing around with it myself to kind of see what's going on. A quick introduction about myself. So my name is Sage Elliott, as Nathan already said. Uh, I'm a machine learning and MLOps evangelist at Y Labs. So kind of like think of that as a developer relations role. So I use our tool and I get to build cool applications with it. And at Y Labs, uh, we build tools to enable observability and ML monitoring uh, or data monitoring in, in pipelines in, in uh, various ways. And we'll see some of that in action today. And for over the past decade, I've worked as a software or a hardware engineer, um, in mostly with startups and agencies in Seattle, and also a little bit in Melbourne, Florida. And I saw someone in the chat um, said they were in Florida. There's always, almost always someone there, so you probably know where Melbourne is. Um, in general, I love making things with technology. And if you want to stay connected, uh, feel free to do so uh, with me on LinkedIn. You can just search for me, say Juliet, two L's and two T's, and hopefully I'll come up for you, or uh, you can directly go to that link. About you, so uh, I always like doing this when I'm doing live talks or workshops, because I don't really get to talk to people like you do in person. Um, I know already people were saying hello in the chat, but I definitely uh, encourage you if you haven't to say hello in there. And again, maybe put where you're watching from. And if you want to add a little bit more details, what are you building with LLMs? Do you have any interesting applications right now um, that, you, that you're that you looking to build? Or do you have um, a reason like in your head right now why you might want to be monitoring your ML applications, uh, let us know in the chat. I think it's really fun to kind of see a little bit more about the audience. And then also, um, if you want to stay connected after this and ask follow-up questions where I you maybe you didn't have them here right now, um, you can join me in this Slack channel later. I won't see any questions in there right now, so please keep them in the live stream chat here. But if you have questions about um, anything I talked about in putting it into your own project, uh, join there and ask them later. And again, um, I already shared these links a little bit ago, so I won't share them in the chat again right now. Um, but we're just going to use a Google Colab um, and the YLabs free account. And I'm guessing most people already have a Google account, so you'll be able to uh, run all the code. All right, so what is AI observability at a high level? And we're going to be talking about this at a high level and then tie it into large language models pretty quickly here. Um, you probably have your ML model and pipeline where you know, you're streaming in data, you're either training your model or you've been, um, your model's deployed and you're making predictions on new data. And then you wanna be collecting some sort of um, statistics and metrics probably around what's going on in that pipeline. And at a bare minimum, when people are getting started with ML observability or monitoring in general, I always say, you know, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, um, or, or these advanced use cases where you could put it in multiple parts of the pipeline, just collect the in, the direct input to your model and the direct output of your model. Um, especially when it comes to large language models, uh, you collect the prompt and response, and you can extract a lot of meaningful metrics out of those, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then you want to take these metrics and probably store them somewhere. So that could be um, an observability platform like YLabs, um, or you can take those metrics and you know build your own platform or store them locally, depends on your application and need. And then with those metrics, uh, you'll be able to create reports and dashboards, have alerts and notifications, or trigger workflows back into your ML pipeline. So if data um, completely shifted from your training data set in a model, you could potentially take that new data coming in that was outside of the training distribution, annotate that data, and then retrain your model with that kind of new variation of your data. And hopefully your model is going to generalize better on that new data. And if you have a, a well-made MLOps pipeline, that should hopefully be like a pretty easy thing to do. And we'll see again how to kind of set up the ML monitoring side today and how to potentially make that trigger that you could trigger the rest of the pipeline on. 
And um, I'll just quickly note, so the way we work with our open source libraries, we have one called Ylogs, which is kind of for logging data of any kind. And then we have one called Lankit, which is what we're going to be seeing today. And Lankit's built on top of Ylogs. And how it works is it's this telemetry gathering um, part of this diagram where we collect kind of um, privacy preserving data statistics so that it actually doesn't contain your raw data in there, there anymore. And we'll see what this looks like in a little bit. Um, but just know like you're not going to be passing your raw data out to the platform. And this is um, really, I mean, it can be used in, in in any industry and there's some really neat things about it, but it's a really big deal for industries like healthcare or fintech where you really can't be moving out your um, raw data set to any other platforms. Um, these are just kind of like summary statistics and we'll see what this looks like for LMs here in a minute. Um, all right, so real quick again, just on ML monitoring, there's a whole bunch of different things you, you could be monitoring for. This could be things like data drift, like we had talked about, maybe you've experienced this before. If you've put a model in production, uh, the data that starts coming in production no longer quite matches the training data. Um, and so if it goes above a certain, you know, distribution threshold, chances are your model may not be working as good anymore. You have the things like accuracy and recall, bias and fairness, which is a you know whole thing in itself, like monitoring in production, uh, making sure that your model isn't being biased towards any class or, or specific group of data. And then with LMs, you also have things like security is a big deal right now where um, I don't know if, how much you've used LMs so far, but if you tried to get ChatGPT or something like that to um, you know, output things like phone numbers or sensitive data. Um, that's going to be a really big deal for a lot of large language models, especially maybe if you're building your own internally and you, you know, don't have all these extra guardrails and stuff that OpenAI is putting onto your model. You're definitely going to want to be monitoring for things like that. And then uh, jailbreak is a big one too. So, you know, people trying to get your model to do something that it shouldn't be doing. Um, how can you monitor for that? We're going to kind of dive into that today. We have a saying at Y Labs: bad data happens to good models. So you can do as much as valuation as you want when you put it in production again uh, often you know something uh, could go right there and also just um, noting as well especially with large language models um, you can use these metrics to improve your models not necessarily always just monitoring for something bad that's happening uh, you could be monitoring for different prompts that make your model um, increase the behavior that you want and monitor that over time and then select the best prompt in there. So it's not always looking for bad things. It's also looking for ways to improve your model in production or before you put it in production. Um, so large language models, you're probably familiar with them at this point. Um, who here has used a large language model? I'm guessing if you're attending this talk, most people have. It is always interesting when I talk with people, you know, outside of my little bubble of tech friends and stuff like that. Um, you know, when I talk about other people and maybe they even are in tech and then they haven't used OpenAI yet. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Like, not everyone is actually using um, ChatGPT so far. Um, and today we're going to be using Hugging Face in our talk. Um, but what I'm going to talk about can be really used on any of the large language models that you might be using. And again, if you want to put in the chat, um, let, uh, let me know what type of model or what type of library you're using. So that could be OpenAI. GPT, it could be Hugging Face, it could be Bing. Um, do you have any favorite model that you're you're currently using or, or building with? It could be Falcon. Um, all right, so some common pain points with large language models, and um, you, know, you might be building a chatbot, summarization app, Q&A, um, agents. Those are some of the most common probably use cases I see with large language models right now. Um, some of the common pain points that come up is hallucinations. And you can kind of argue that, uh, um, Every output from a large language model is kind of a hallucination because it hopefully it's not just repeating text, it's, you know, kind of coming up with something based on what it's seen before. But usually when we say hallucinations, we're saying, you know, it's kind of out of bounds and actually not giving us really relevant information. Um, so how can you monitor for that? Prompt engineering is a big deal right now. Uh, most people I know talking that I've talked with putting models in production are often using um, a GPT model, sometimes hugging face. I, I think I saw someone said they're using Llama 2. So that's kind of coming up a lot more now as well. Um, and with GPT models, which I think are probably still the most popular in, in uh, the applications, for a long time, you couldn't even fine tune them. So the way you would train or change the behavior model was with prompt engineering. So you, you give your model a system prompt saying, you know, you are a helpful assistant and I want you to do whatever, whatever. Um, and then when I would talk with people, saying, oh, you changed this prompt in production 
and you think it made it better, how do you know? Um, so, you know, oftentimes you don't really consistently measure because a, a lot of people just say, well, I changed it. Maybe I tested it on a prompt or two and I thought it was better. Um, but um, what you should probably be doing, and I think this is the future of prompt engineering and making LMs better, is monitoring those changes, whether that is before you put the model in production or when the model's already in production and you want to try to improve um, the behavior of your model, what you're probably going to be doing is monitoring, which again, we'll see this in action, but you'll be able to maybe change your prompt and see how it changes. And one thing I also like to talk about doing is having kind of multiple um, or one model with multiple prompts and seeing how those prompts differed. So you could have like five different prompts and then over a week's worth of time, monitor which one was giving the best results and then choose that best one after that week of data, for example, and then deploy that in production to your user. So I'm really excited. Uh, I think this is going to make large language models uh, even better. And then output validation. This is, um, you know, where it, it can be kind of hard to validate if the response was really good. Um, maybe it didn't follow instructions. And then again, security is a big thing that comes up when I talk with people right now with LMs in production is how do you make sure it's not giving you values that you don't want um, generated? For example, I was building a LLM chatbot for like a, a, um, a web store. And when I said something like, oh, I didn't like this product, um, the GPT model gave a phone number out. And I never told it to give a phone number out and I never said what the phone number was. So it just kind of made one up and put it out, which is probably really bad. So someone called that phone number, maybe it goes to a real person. Uh, they probably wouldn't be very happy that our, our chat model is giving out phone numbers, right? And you also want to make sure maybe potentially that, you know, if someone's asking, for asking your tax bot or something like that for medical advice, that it's not providing uh, medical advice. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff around security and LM liability in the next several years. So how do we solve these problems? Well, one, we can add guardrails. You might have seen this before. And um, this is kind of behind the scenes. I don't know exactly how they're doing it. But when they talk about, you know, chat GBT kind of getting less capable sometimes, um, uh, there's been some interesting research around that. That's often, I think, coming from them adding constraints and guardrails to their model to make sure it's not, you know, outputting anything negative or what they deem, you know, unresponsible from their model. So that could be things like people trying to jailbreak the model again, where you're trying to get it to do something that it shouldn't do. So a common example of this is, you know, if you try to get ChatGPT to write you uh, malware, it'll say no. That's, you know, I'm not going to do that. But there are ways sometimes of getting around kind of that barrier where. You could, you know, say, uh, here's a made up language or whatever, <laughs> and now do this thing with this made up language. And then it'll like read something like that and then actually uh, follow those instructions. You might want to be, be, again, making sure that you have no medical advice coming out of something that shouldn't be providing medical advice. And also, I'm excited. There probably are going to be really cool chatbots that will provide medical advice. But again, if you're doing taxes or something like that, probably that chatbot shouldn't be um, giving out that type of advice. And then again, security, this is something that keeps coming up. Um, I've already mentioned it, but just making sure that no, uh, um, no sensitive data basically is, is um, coming out of models, but also a lot of companies are worried about sensitive data going into models. So there are ways where you could potentially add a guardrail looking for some sort of PII or proprietary company information and then kind of stopping that whole prompt altogether going to something like an uh, open AI model. Um, evaluation. So I kind of already talked about this where on the prompt engineering, being able to you know, select multiple prompts or run multiple prompts in production and then select the best one over time. It's also really exciting because uh, the prompts have, you know, such a big impact on the behavior and fine tuning does as well. And you could also fine tune models and monitor those in production and select the best model. Uh, but prompt engineering is so cheap. You're not really training a model there. You're just running an API call um, a couple of times and seeing which one performed better. So it's really exciting. And then observability, just kind of generally seeing how people are using your product over time, you know, or your responses, like what are they doing over time? Is the readability there, like a readability score? Um, is the sentiment going down or up? Uh, are, you know, sentiments from prompts going down? That could mean people are kind of more upset with your product potentially. Um, so monitoring for all these kind of statistics that could give you some sort of sign of what's going on with your model. Um, all right, so solving at scale. So this is where our library LangKit comes in. Um, you can integrate it with 
basically any large language model in a Python environment right now. We have some other stuff uh, coming out soon where you can kind of probably create a wrapper around some other code environments. But right now, I think most people are probably running their models in Python. And it kind of works like this. So you have any large language model, you have a prompt going into that model, you have a response coming out of that model. We can log the prompt and response together. We could log just the prompt, just the response. It doesn't need to be both of them. Most people are using both unless you want to block a prompt going into the model first. Um, and then with these metrics that we're going to extract out of here, we can measure things like quality, sentiment, um, security, et cetera. Um, the library is open source. It has integrations with some of the most popular libraries like Langchain, for example. Uh, but also, you don't really need to um, probably have an official integration all the time with these libraries. It's very easy in just a few lines of code to pass in a prompt and response and then get these metrics that we're going to talk about. And you can use these metrics to kind of um, enforce or monitor all the things that we've already talked about in the previous slide. So here's an example of what this looks like. You have a prompt coming in. In this case, it says something is wrong with my order. It's kind of a chatbot example of like a um, an online store. You're extracting metri metrics out of this. So you can see there's a sentiment score. That's a, I think the sentiment score here is from an NLTK model and it goes from negative one to plus one. So that's a fairly negative one. You know, it says something's wrong. Um, it has a minus 0 0.5. And we have a jailbreak similarity score. It's not very close to jailbreak. It's actually not very toxic at all. It has a reading level assigned to it. And you get all these um, metrics from the response as well, as well as a response relevancy score, which is calculated by looking at the embeddings. Um, so out of the box, it has things like response relevancy, has patterns. The has patterns includes things like looking for phone numbers, credit cards, uh, emails, and I forget if there's any other ones out of the box for has patterns, but you can also create any custom metrics you want. So if you have anything specific you're looking for, like PII, uh, you can make a custom metric pretty easily uh, to do that for you. Um, so out of the box, it also has sentiment, toxicity, jailbreak similarity, um, category. So we can see like uh, how, you know, is this like healthcare advice or is it um, financial? I think there's um, some out of the box categories like that difficult words, reading score, and more. And again, it's easy to add metrics. And you can kind of see, you know, we're just extracting these metrics from it. So it's actually very privacy preserving. We don't take or um, pro, like when we create a profile with Linkit or Ylogs, that's what it's called when you extract all these metrics out. Um, it doesn't really contain your raw data anymore. So very privacy preserving. And it looks a little bit like this to use it. And again, we'll see this in action here in a minute. Uh, but you can just pip install Linkit into your environment. And we import a couple of things. We define a schema, which is uh, saying, you know, we're, look, we're tracking all these language metrics. To write to YLabs, uh, you just initialize a telemetry agent. And this is actually the profiling that happens that extracts those metrics out. So we just pass in that prompt and response. We're going to get all that um, metrics that we talked about. And then we can just easily write it up to YLabs. Um, or again, you could also use these metrics just in your local environment here or potentially, you know, uh, you know, send them anywhere to an S3 bucket, uh, your own platform, et cetera. And then with that, you're able to gain some insights like, is there overall negative sentiment? Is my data uh, imbalanced? Are there patterns that popped up? Those things like credit cards, uh, phone numbers, et cetera. And that's actually how I found out that my uh, LM was providing phone numbers is I was looking at just kind of this general observability over time. And it said phone number was detected. And I was like, what? I never told it to give a phone number. And I thought it was crazy that it was just making one up and giving <laughs> giving it out. So um, definitely having observability like this can also help you kind of understand what your elms are doing in production. And then maybe potentially go back and add those guardrails in that, um, you know, we didn't know it was giving a phone number out. Maybe we, it, you know, Maybe that was a use case we should have thought of, but we didn't at the time. And now either want to add a guardrail or go back to my prompt and probably give it a correct phone number to provide when it needs to provide a phone number. I mean, then this is kind of an example of monitoring these values over time. And then you can set up a monitor saying, you know, if the value looks a certain way or drifts a certain amount, trigger an alert, and then do those things like we talked about in the pipeline, such as uh, triggering a workflow or you could get that alert notification and maybe you just go manually investigate it. All right, so enough slides. Let's go ahead and do the code part. So I'll share the scan. I think um, they also shared this. So if you haven't already, um, you can create this free YLabs account. Again, there's no card or anything required. It should be very easy to sign up. And then uh, we're going to be running code in this Colab notebook. Oh, and this is optional. Uh, you don't need this for the workshop at all. 
But if you kind of like what you're seeing here with the free plan of Ylabs, uh, there's a promo code to get some of the um, enterprise features, I think for 30 days, if you want to try out some of the features that are in there, like we'll see um, when we get in there, but we have things like monitoring in batches by days and with enterprise features, you can also do things like monitor in hours. And give me one second here. I need to pull up one more tab, but go ahead and open up the Colab notebook. It should look like this. Scroll up to the top. Once you're in here, I recommend making your own copy. You should be able to run all the code on your own, um, but uh, or or without making a copy. But if you save a copy, then you can uh, really change things all you want and come back to it. And I recommend definitely playing around with it as you go and changing things. And then you can just bookmark this original link and always come back to it if you do break it. So don't worry about breaking it. Um, so you go to file save a copy and drive. And then if somebody in the chat wants to let me know that that link did work, they were able to open up the notebook and they were able to save a copy and drive, that would be great. This one said it works. Awesome, I just had to get prepared for my other tab here. This one said all good. Awesome. Um, and there's a couple questions. So while people are pulling that up, I'm gonna try to get to just a couple of these questions and I might not get to all of them right now. Um, someone said link it works for only in English or is it working for other languages too? So there's some, I think, out of the box metrics in um, the models behind the scenes. So we'll see as we go kind of what this looks like. Right now, um, it is, I think, looking at English with a lot of the out of the box statistics, but you can create custom metrics, like I'd mentioned, that's actually pretty easy to do. So for example, you could use a different language model that you know are gonna extract those metrics that you want. And then, um, basically create the similar uh, profile with them. So out of the box, uh, probably mostly English. I haven't tried um, all the statistics on a different language, so I'm not 100% sure, like some of them might still work, um, but I think most of these models behind the scenes that are extracting them are for Eng in English right now. All right, so I see some people made the copy. Um, there are some links here if you want to read more about things like text quality, text relevance, et cetera, those scores um, calculated with Linkit. And again, the library is also open source, so you can go really dig in all the code as much as you want. Um, so in this example, we're going to look at creating some of the out-of-the-box metrics like we saw and um, with uh, Hugging Face and Linkit. And we're going to monitor them also in YLabs. So we'll be looking at doing stuff locally just with the metrics, but then we'll also look at how we can use YLabs to monitor them over time. And for this example, we're going to be using the GPT-2 model um, in Hugging Face. And it is because it's extremely lightweight and we can run it without a GPU. So if you made a copy of this and we're just in a CPU instance, it, everything should run fairly fast here, um, even though we're just on a CPU instance. So that's why we're going to be using GPT-2. But um, I have an example, if you want to change this out for a more practical model like Falcon or Llama 2, you can actually do that pretty easily. So again, uh, save a copy and drive if you haven't. And here's useful links potentially uh, for you to look at later, like Linkit, Ylogs, and the Slack channel. So you can ask questions there after the workshop. If you ask them now, probably won't see them. And let's go ahead and run this first code cell. So if you haven't used Google Colab before, it's basically... Uh, Google's way of hosting a Jupyter Notebook. And if you haven't used a Jupyter Notebook, um, it's a way of uh, you know, running code and providing text and documentation and outputs kind of all in one place. To run this code cell, you can hit this play button. Or when a cell is highlighted, you can hit shift enter. That's probably what I'm going to be doing a lot of. Oops, I made a copy. So I'm going to run my copy here. If you hit shift enter, um, it'll take a few seconds to run the first cell because it's actually connecting and kind of spinning up a whole little Ubuntu instance for you behind the scenes here. Now it says, hello world, and we should be good to go. So we're just going to do pip install um, a few libraries here. We're going to install transformers by Hugging Face, which is what we're going to use to run the GPT-2 model. Gradio, which is a quick UI builder, also maintained by Hugging Face. And then we're going to also install Linkit to extract those metrics. Um, also, Google Colabs comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of the 
um, kind of commonly used machine learning libraries, so scikit-learn, TensorFlow, et cetera, are kind of already in there. Just take a few seconds, but it's cool that you can pip install other libraries as well. So if you haven't used Google Colab before, um, it's a really cool tool. I like it a lot. And it does have free, uh, you don't need to do this right now, but it does have uh, free GPU time. So you can actually open up a Colab notebook and go to change runtime type, and they'll give you a certain amount of free GPU usage. So it's a really cool way to get started with a deep learning or computer vision if you don't actually have like a good GPU, GPU at home to uh, train a model on. Um, also, some of the instances are slightly different. So when you run Colab, you don't quite know which hardware you're getting, um, especially if you're on the free tier. So sometimes, like if I run a code cell, hopefully this will all, all run pretty fast for uh, everyone. But, uh, you know, for example, it might take a little bit longer on your instance than someone else watching or on mine. So if mine looks super fast, just be patient with yours and uh, it'll it'll run. All right, so let's go ahead and run this code cell. We're going to import LM metrics from Lankit. And then we're going to define this link hit schema where we're going to call a variable schema and we're going to initialize the LM metric. So it's going to provide all those ones out of the box like I talked about. The first time you run this, it's going to take just a few seconds here because it's actually downloading the models used behind the scenes to extract those metrics that we saw. Once you run this for the first time, um, it's not going to take you know this amount of time again. It already has those models now loaded, so it can just extract metrics very easily. Um, one thing to note, is if you define a custom metric, which I'll share how to do a little bit later, you want to run this uh, in it again, and then it'll add the custom metric in. So just right now, out of the box, it um, is going to get those metrics that we talked about. And we'll see all those here in a second. So we can run this code cell. This is actually just kind of importing some test examples real quick. And just this is just to really show you kind of those metrics here. And we'll actually see in the next section how to create our own model and then extract statistics from that prompt and response. But uh, we're just loading in this uh, load chats, which contains 50 examples. And then we're going to call this y.log. This is where the profiling happens, where we're actually um, extracting those metrics that we talked about. So we're going to pass in the chats. Uh, it can take anything that's in a Python dictionary format or in a data frame format. format. And um, in, in the style of prompt on one column and response on the other one. And then we give it a name. You don't have to give it a name. Uh, that's only if you want that profile to have a name. And then we pass in that schema, which is um, all those initialized metrics that we talked about. And now we can actually look at what this looks like. This um, contains all those metrics for our profile. So we pass in 50 chats here. And these are the statistics for all 50 of those chats kind of combined together here. So we can see that counts was 50. That's how many um, chats we profiled. We can see that cardinality was 47 for prompts. So there's actually uh, three prompts that are very similar here. We can see, you know, aggregate reading level, um, character count, et cetera, all these different things. These are the cardinality right now. But if I scroll over, we'll get things like the uh, max. So this was, let's just look at this reading level, for example, which is near the top. So we can see the max score here is 28. And the mean is 7. And the median is eight and then i should have uh, expanded the data frame so we can see all the metrics but basically we have the max the mean the median and then some quantiles on all these metrics so we can get the upper and lower bound on them as well and so there's a whole bunch in here the ones we already talked about like jailbreak similarity letter count etc um people often ask what's one metric that you know you should measure for your large language model and unfortunately depends on the application there isn't just one metric you know that i've seen or that I don't think anyone has seen, definitely let me know if uh, you found one that can really be used across all different LLM applications and give you, you know, super valuable insight to it. So a lot of times it's kind of, um, if you don't know what you're looking for right away, I recommend just, you know, monitoring kind of all these things and figuring out the ones that actually provide good insight for your um, model. But if you're using specific applications, like a summarization app, you know, you might be looking at things like, um, letter count or word count could be a good one or character count or readability level you know your summarization should probably be pretty readable i'm guessing if that's the purpose of your app um so there's some stuff like think about the application think about what users would want um sentiments a big one like response sen sentiment you know if your model's kind of being rude or very negative that might not be what people want um and same with toxic um refusal summary which is kind of saying, you know, it's like, no, it's not going to answer that question. 
sometimes that's really good because your LM might not uh, be able to or should answer those questions. Again, like going back to that medical advice example, um, but uh, maybe it's, you know, saying it's refusing to answer something that it should be and you could go back and look at that and change your prompt or, or fine tune your model more. So a whole bunch of out of the box metrics to start giving you good insight um, and start using these. And potentially if you want to add a custom metric, again, it's very easy to do. Um, and I'd recommend just starting with out of the box unless you have one on mind that you want to uh, start monitoring. But we can see an example of what these chats look like. So this is just what we profiled here. We have these prompts and responses. So it's hello world. Um, you could scroll through these and maybe get an idea of like, you know, why it profiled uh, these metrics. Like why was it negative or why was uh, it very positive? So someone said, this is a good question for each of these metrics you can find and explore the prompt and responses, I assume. So you extract these metrics out and um, then you can try to trace it back or you can trace it back to your prompt and responses. Those aren't stored in these profiles though. And that's kind of uh, a feature where, you know, again, talking about privacy preservation, um, it just stores these summary statistics around your prompt and response. Um, you can see like either the time period or potentially add in like a custom um, ID with a custom metric. And then it is something we're also working on is making, um, making uh, a tracing a little bit easier to go from like this profile back to the original one. Someone said, why did we get this warning? Um, oh, here. So uh, there's a feature. Uh, you can just uh, simply, you can just ignore this. Um, there's a feature in Ylogs where you can initialize it um, and create something called a non session, which then can tie back to uh, Ylabs very easily. We're not going to use that today. Um, it's OK that uh, you're getting this warning for now. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, but there's a feature that we just didn't initialize. And I think it's just telling us, hey, you know, you didn't initialize this feature that a lot of people want. Um, and that's OK for this workshop. We're going to use use a, um, a different way to write, write to Y Labs here in a second. So we have an idea of these kind of metrics now. Let's look at actually building kind of a simple model using GPT-2 and then extracting those metrics and then how we can either monitor them over time or potentially use those metrics to um, add a guardrail into our project. So here, I'm just going to import um, some models from Hugging Face. Again, this will take a second the first time you run it. And again, we're using GPT-2 because uh, it's pretty lightweight and you'll be able, to be able to run it kind of on any instance that uh, uh, Google will give you on the free collab version. And that's actually kind of fun if you've never run it before. Um, you know, it's very different than GPT-3.5 where it got really big and you'll see some kind of funny responses probably in it. Um, and just noting, so here we're using GPT-2, but like I mentioned, you can really use this on any of your other models that you're looking at. Like someone mentioned they're using Llama 2. Uh, you would just do a very similar thing in Hugging Face, but pass in your downloaded weights like this. So I think if you uncommented this, um, I might say you have to download it, but you can go ahead and download, download those weights on your local machine or cloud, wherever you're you know, hosting or training your model, and then initialize it like this. So very similar to exactly what we're doing today, just pass in a different value here for the different type of model you want. And also, yeah, if anyone has another lightweight model that they actually like running in this use case, like on a collab, uh, let me know, because I could switch this out next time for a lightweight model that should be able to run on a CPU um, instance would be cool. All right, so let's create a pretty simple function here. Uh, we're just going to call it GPT model. We're going to get um, the tokens from our prompts. So we're using um, the Hugging Face tokenizer to kind of just encode our prompt here. And then we're going to generate text based on that prompt. And you could change this around if you wanted to have like max length shorter or longer. Temperature, um, as you might already know, is kind of how creative or less creative your model is. So a value of zero would be completely less creative. So feel free to tune this around if you want. And then we're going to get a response back from our decoder. And then we're just going to log this in a dictionary here with prompt and response. And we're going to return that dictionary out as prompt and response. So if I run this, that create our model or our uh, function, here I can run this function and we'll see, we'll get the prompt and response out. And we'll take a minute because we are not a full minute, a few seconds because we're like um, running that GPT model just on a CPU again. So it takes a few seconds kind of per prompt here. But I said, tell me a story about a cute dog. 
And then this is the prompt or the response from GPT. It's kind of completing this. It's kind of, you know, writing a little story here. Uh, so now we have this stored in this dictionary. We can extract metrics like we saw before. And let's go ahead and run this. This is going to be doing exactly kind of the same thing we did up above where we're initializing our schema for our large language model metrics. And then if I call profile or y.log, that's creating that profile, which is again, extracting those metrics that we saw out. And here we can see this on our um, one prompt and response now. We, so we can see that we just logged one of these, our cardinality is one. And if I look through all these, I also um, made Panda show the max column this time. So we can actually see all the metrics in here. So again, we could just look at that readability score and um, see those metrics for the, the distribution metrics, like the max, the mean, the median, et cetera, the min, um, and then we have those distribution scores. And we'll see how to kind of visualize these all in a second here. But you can now already kind of start using these if you wanted to um, in your own uh, Python environment. And, and uh, like I said, you might want to use this as like a guardrail, like if it was really toxic or something like that, don't pass that prompt over to the model, or at least don't return the response from that model. So let's do this on multiple prompts now. Uh, we're going to um, say, what is an AI joke? Oh, so I forgot to comment this out. I rec If you run this, it should be fine. It just might give you a little bit of a weird score. I am actually going to comment this out here. And because we already initialized our um, first profile up here, what I'm going to do is just call this profile.track on it. And it's going to loop through all these prompts here. And then we're going to get the prompt and response for each one. And then we can call this dot .track on the profile here. And uh, this will kind of just add them together. So if I run this, again, okay, it will take a minute here running on our CPU instance because it's doing three prompts with GPT-2. And now we could look at our metrics again. And this should be, um, if I did it, I uncommented that thing or I commented that thing. So the count should be four. Your count might be like five or six or something like that. Um, if you didn't comment that out, totally fine for the rest of the workshop. And then here now we have an aggregate score for all those things like we saw before. So we'll have actually them in the maximine, et cetera. Uh, whereas before when we looked at them in the maximine on just one profile, um, you know, it didn't really change between them because we just logged one thing. So now these are kind of all going into batches together and we get these aggregate st statistics about it. And this works well for, so if you're monitoring something like, you know, hundreds or like, uh, uh, yeah, like let's say like hundreds or thousands of prompts and responses, um, you can kind of get really good insight around them versus like looking at into uh, um, every individual one. Like that's kind of how I found that phone number with that has patterns feature because there are so many prompts going in, I couldn't look at everyone, but then I was able to get the kind of these insights about these batches of what contained it or what was contained in them or what was the sentiment score, et cetera. And then I could go back and look at the, the prompts and responses and trace back to the one that outputted the phone number, which is kind of wild. So now we looked at how we could extract these metrics and we'll come back to how to use them a little bit, um, uh, use them locally a little bit later. But first, let's go look at how we can monitor these and visualize them in the Y Labs platform. So we have those metrics. Now we can kind of write them somewhere where we can get the distribution over time, get this time series view. And then if it drastically changes anywhere in there um, or goes above a certain threshold, however we set up our monitor, then we can uh, get an alert or have some sort of trigger in our uh, workflow to do something. So again, if you haven't created the YLabs account, this is going to be the part where you're going to want to do that. because so we're going to use it in the next part here. Oops, I forgot on Colab. It does this now. So I'll give everyone just a few seconds here if they sign up if they haven't already. And I'm going to get a drink of water while they do that. Of course, on camera, I'm going to swallow water weird. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. <laughs> Only when people are watching, though. <laughs> <clears throat> 
<laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to keep going here. Um, and also, if I don't get to your question now, I can uh, try to come back to them. But for time's sake, I want to keep moving forward so we can get through uh, most of this at the hour mark. So um, I'm going to go into my Y Labs account now. So if you hit sign up for free, um, you should have an account. It should look something like this. And uh, what I'm going to do is create a new resource because we basically want to create a new model or a new project that we can start sending this data to and um, <laughs> monitor over time. So go ahead and hit this Create Resource tab. And if your homepage looks different, you can always get to the homepage by clicking Y Labs. I think you have two demo models in there currently. So I'm just going to hit um, Create Resource. This brings us to this model page. And I'm on the free tier here as well. And uh, what I want to do is actually just go ahead and delete a couple of these models. So if you have a demo model, feel free to delete one or two. Uh, we're going to create a second model in this workshop. So I'm going to go ahead and free up space for two more here. Uh, we can basically have uh, three models in this case running. <clears throat> so I'm going to call this um, DSD workshop. You can call it whatever you want. And then resource type. This is important to select large language model. Uh, you can always come back and edit this. So if you do mess up and you forgot to do it here, it's totally fine. And all this is really going to do in our case is kind of change the interface that's given to us. So if you didn't select the right one, you passed up all the data that we're going to do here in a second, uh, you just might not see some of the same stuff displayed correctly. So just make sure you hit large language model. And then I'm going to hit add model or data set. So now I have this model ID. I'm going to grab this. Mine is model 279. Yours, I think, starts at uh, model two or model three, because you already had a couple in there. So I'm going to copy this ID over. I'm going to go back to, to my notebook and I'm going to paste it into this model ID section and uh, make sure that you don't accidentally bring over any uh, spaces or new line characters. We just want to, this to be a string with no spaces or anything like this. So go back to the platform from the same page that you're on. We're looking at models right now. Go over to this other tab called access tokens. We'll grab this. I'm going to create a new access token. I'll call this DSD, create token. Now it should pop up here. And then just hit copy. Um, once you're off of this page, you reload it. This, you'll, you won't be able to see this full token again. So you can copy and save it. Uh, but you can always create another new token, which is totally fine. So come over here, paste in the API key. And then uh, the org ID is actually on the end of this API key right now. And I'm going to just copy it from here, the second. And we're, we're going to have a feature soon where um, instead of passing in the org ID and the API key, you'll be able to just pass in one of these and you'll you'll get both of those set. Um, but if you want to grab your org ID ever also from the YLabs platform, you can see it's listed here and it's also listed here on this page. So you could just copy uh, one of these over as well. And um, I know some people go a little bit slower here because I've used the platform all the time. <laughs> and so I can be a little fast. I'm going to walk through these steps again, um, just in case someone wasn't able to follow along yet. So again, I could be on my homepage here. You can always get the homepage by clicking Y Labs. You can always also get to where we wanted to go by hitting that, that uh, create resource. But you can also always go to settings from this hamburger menu on the left, go to settings, and then go to model and data set management. And then again, create your new model here and then get this model ID. And some people say, why is it a model? Well, in this case, we are writing uh, data up that is coming out of a model. Uh, but you can also use these kind of um, for just monitoring data in your pipeline as well. So did I think I see some people in the chat said they signed up. <laughs> Someone said they, they like the name hamburger menu. <laughs> I always thought that was funny when I was learning uh, web development, which uh, I used to do a long time ago as well, front end stuff. And uh, it looks like somebody said they were able to sign up. Did uh, a couple people or someone want to, again want to let me know in the chat that you were able to sign up and uh, kind of do one of these steps? It'd be great to hear that some someone else was able to follow along. I was going to say you can give me a thumbs up in the chat, but are, are there emojis in Zoom chat? I forget. Oh, there are. Someone give me a, a thumbs up in the chat if uh, you were able to create an account and create a new model that we saw here. People said thumbs up. Someone said smiley face. I hope that means the same thing. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the notebook. Um, if anyone needs to kind of um, 
come back here, let me know, and I can go over the steps again, but I'm gonna keep running through the notebook. So we wanna run this code cell now. This sets our environment variables in our environment to the API key and org ID here. Now, again, we're gonna do kind of exactly like we've already done above, where we're just importing um, LM metrics and initializing that, but we're also importing something called a YLabs writer. This is going to allow us to take that data and metrics that we extracted and then actually push them up to YLabs here. So now if I run this code cell, um, it should, yep, it says true. So we're initializing our telemetry agent, which is the YLabs writer. And then we're logging the model, which is getting those um, uh, metrics that we already talked about. And then we're saying dot write on our telemetry agent, passing in that profile view. And then now this profile should have been written over to YLabs. So if we go back to our YLabs platform, I'm gonna go back to my homepage. I'm gonna click into our new project, the DSD workshop into it. Uh, there's a little summary dashboard here. This gets more interesting the more data you put in, but we can see that there's 33 metrics extracted and that's what we're going to be monitoring. Um, and if I click into, let's just go ahead and click into Telemetry Explorer right now and just click into any of these. doesn't matter which one right now. We can see that uh, we had one profile uploaded. Now this doesn't look super interesting right now because uh, you know it just <laughs> uploaded one thing, doesn't even have a distribution metric right now because it was just one profile. So there's just basically the median, max, and min are all the same, in this case, zero. Um, this was our, what score did I kick in? Uh, aggregate reading level. So now let's go ahead and make this a little bit more interesting. Uh, we can run the code cell or run these next code cells. Uh, what this is going to do is um, this is going to simulate kind of our model being in production for seven days. So we're going to kind of write seven days of data, if you will. Um, we just have a list here. And inside that list, there's um, seven lists and each one contains three prompts. So we're going to be looping through these kind of seven lists acting as if we were having our model in production for seven days. And then we're gonna write three prompts for each day, extract those metrics out, and then view them in that time series view. So again, this will take um, maybe a minute or something like that with uh, the, the speed that GPT runs on the CPU here. And then uh, we're also going to append all of our prompts and responses. So if we wanna look at them later, um, we can as well. And this kind of goes, this is a pretty simple example here, but we can look at things like the, um, sentiment score, and then we could go look at those prompts and responses and kind of understand why we got those scores back. So that someone had mentioned, right, getting these metrics, that's great, you know, something happened there, but then you want to be able to often probably tie it back to those prompts and responses and figure out exactly what went wrong. Someone asked, what does PT stand for in the return tensors? Um, I'd, uh, we can scroll back up to that later, but I believe that's probably uh, PyTorch. I think when we import PyTorch as PT. And I think that's where we get our um, um, embeddings from in that case. Yep, someone in the chat said, yep, it's PyTorch tensor. Usually if you see a PT in a lot of the deep learning stuff like this, it's going to be a, a PyTorch application. Someone said, what open source framework do you suggest for fine tuning LMs along with data preparation with PDF documents and then auto tuning functionalities with feedback? Um, if anyone has a good one they like, definitely uh, please put it in the chat. And I haven't found one tool necessarily to do all those things yet. Um, and I'm not sure with the PDF documents. I wonder uh, one tool I've been looking at um, potentially making some examples with later for kind of fine tuning and doing your own data annotation is um, label box. I don't know if they have automatic PDF um, extraction, but they might. Does anyone in the chat have a favorite kind of open source tool right now? And I've been using Langchain for running um, some of my models and tying things together. And I'm also looking at uh, Llama Index too and building some examples with all of those. All right, so my code cell is done running. Uh, someone said semantic kernel. Uh, that, that's uh, Microsoft's, which uh, looks really cool. I actually haven't uh, played with it yet, but it is on my list to do. All right, so mine is done running again. Uh, yours might still be running just for a little bit longer, but I'm going to go back to my YLabs platform. Now I'm going to refresh my page. 
And now we can kind of see what our telemetry looks like over time. So all those metrics we saw before, now we kind of have in this really cool time series view. And it gives us really good insight, you know, either how our users are behaving or how our responses are behaving over time. So I recommend just clicking on, you know, these ones that sound interesting to you, like what is response letter count? Again, this could be a really good score, maybe if you're doing a summarization app. And then also maybe you'd want to see, you know, what is uh, prompt sentiment. This is kind of like how, you know, users are behaving with the app over time. But you could also look at response sentiment um, to see kind of like what, is, what are the responses looking like over time. I and mean, we can actually see that uh, we had that day where our prompts were pretty negative. And even though our upper bound was still pretty high on the response here, um, it would also had a pretty big lower bound. In fact, the median is pretty low there. So responses actually were pretty negative on a few of these days. Was everyone able to upload the data like we just saw here? I think my internet's going a little slow. All right, so um, let's just look at this prompt sentiment, for example. Uh, we can see that this is what it looks like over time. You have those things like the median, max, min, et cetera. Um, I always just, when I'm eyeballing it, it's really useful to often look at the median so you can kind of see what is the median for that day. Um, by default, uh, you might've saw when you set up the model that you couldn't change it on the free edition and it's batching everything by days, but you could also uh, batch these by hours on the enterprise edition, which again, there's that promo code if you want to sign up for it. It's also at the end of the notebook. Um, so just eyeballing the median here is really interesting. And we can see that, you know, on the second to last day of data, the prompts got uh, very uh, kind of negative at this time. So this is cool. We have now some really good insights that we can look at. Um, there's also a dashboard here that kind of breaks out these features. And we'll come back to this to actually compare a model here in a second. Uh, but it's the same telemetry we were seeing there, but kind of broke it out into, you know, which ones are probably good to monitor for security as well as performance in your model. And there's some other useful features here, like being able to compare models with each other, which we'll see here in a second. But go back to this telemetry tab if you didn't switch or if you did switch out. And then I'm going to go back and just look at this prompt one. Now, this is awesome that we can get this chart and see what our models is doing over time. But um, often we might not be looking at the chart every day or every hour, right? And we want to have a way to let us know when something kind of just uh, drifted a lot or you know, met a threshold that we didn't like and we want to trigger you know, an alert for us to go manually look at it or potentially trigger a job with our MLOps pipeline. And that's where monitors come in. So we can basically set up a monitor to look at any of these pieces of data. And if they go above a certain amount of, um, you know, threshold or below, or again, like a data drift, like comparing it to some other data set, um, trigger an alert. So let's go ahead and do that. Hit this setup monitor tab right here. Um, and let's stick with this one for now. I think this one, you can still create a monitor, but it might not have the preview. So definitely click uh, this one or go to the monitor manager tab here. But I'm going to click this button. That brings us over to the monitor manager tab. Now we have um, some presets as well that make it pretty easy to get started here. Um, you can get really um, into it by uh, like editing all the JSON. And basically, we have all those metrics coming in here. And if you can think of a way you want to monitor those metrics, you can do so. Um, by creating a custom kind of JSON configuration. So don't worry if you if you don't see the thing you want to monitor here in presets, don't worry about it. You can create a custom one. Um, so if you did click on just any of these, for example, brings you to a JSON editor and kind of helps you get started, has a little helper here saying, you know, you need to fill out this value, et cetera. Um, and you can, again, like I said, um, get really like um, into, into it, creating these different types of monitors for kind of any way you want to look at that data. Uh, for this workshop, I'm just going to hit cancel here, but just know that you can come back to that and configure basically any monitor that you're uh, thinking about. But for this workshop, I'm going to go ahead and create a new custom monitor, and I'm going to hit the UI builder feature here. So you can go to JSON configuration or UI builder. Um, JSON configuration basically has no constraints of what you can do. UI builder um, helps you get started here a little bit easier um, if you're if you're new to it. So I'm going to hit drift. We're going to be comparing basically our dis our feature distribution. And if it changes a certain amount, we're going to trigger an alert here. And it's going to be on uh, input columns in this case. And then this is important. I'm going to go ahead and select non-discrete value. So discrete value would be if you're like 
monitoring categorization where you didn't have that many values, a discrete value would be like our numbers right now are like from negative one to one, but they could be any gradient of number in between. And then I'm just going to leave this as all columns of this type. But if you want to select uh, manual columns, you can. And so again, if you're just getting started monitoring your LM and you're not 100% sure what metrics you want to be monitoring, you could be monitoring all of them. Um, and then if you found it was kind of too noisy, like, oh, actually for my application, uh, reading score didn't matter and it was alerting me all the time, you could go ahead and deselect that column. So here, um, I'm also going to change the distance metrics to nine. This means it's going to be less sensitive. If it's a lower number, it's going to be more sensitive. And we have some different ways of calculating um, data drift. If you're more advanced with data science and you kind of know what models are good for what, um, you could choose these different ones. But Hellinger distance is usually pretty good for most things like um, tabular data or, or uh, um, discrete and non-discrete values. So I'll hit next. And then we're just going to leave this as default for now. But you can change this if you want to compare your data between you know, up to 90 days or you could do a reference date range, or you can upload a reference profile. So this is really useful in a lot of other ML applications where if you're deploying a model out and you trained it on a tabular data set, let's say, you could look at that training data set, compare the new data coming into your model to that old data set. And if the distribution was off from the training data set, chances are your model may not be making predictions as good on it. Um, but in this case, we're just gonna be looking at a trailing window and saying, you know, if there's a big shift within the last seven days of data, uh, trigger an alert. And then here you can choose uh, alert severity. This is just for you. So like if you select a specific column and you're like, if that actually changes kind of a low um, thing, it's not a big deal for us. And then you can select actions. Um, so I have email set up by default, but you could do things like a Slack integration or a pager duty integration. And I'm just going to hit save. Now we have a monitor set up here. I'm going to go back to my telemetry explorer. And let's go back and look at that prompt sentiment and LTK. And we can hit preview now. And boom, on that day where it definitely dipped a lot, like if we were manually looking at these values, you know, we can see that, um, again, just looking at the median, like it's 56, uh, 46, kind of around 50 to 40 on all these days. And then all of a sudden it dropped all the way down to, negative 72 got way more negative than all the other seven days of data uh it triggered an alert and this kind of is treated as an anomaly like hey something happened here maybe you want to go check this out all right so uh was there anyone able to set up the monitor that wanted to follow along and i'm gonna go back to the notebook and and uh run the code real quick uh, because i know we're just a little bit over time already so i'm going to run really quickly through the rest of this and then i'll get to um questions i wasn't able to all right so um we went through we were able to um monitor our prompts and responses and then let's go ahead and do one other thing here to kind of look at prompts and responses we're going to import radio as gr I'm going to set up another model in YLab. So this way we can actually kind of compare models to, to each other. So I'm going to do exactly what we did before, create a new resource here. Get, I'll say uh, DSD Workshop 2. You can name it what you want. I'm selecting large language model here so we can compare them together in the same dashboard. Add data. Mine is model 280 now. So I'm going to just reset the model ID here. We didn't need to, need to do these other parts because we did them up above. The API key and org ID is the same. So I'm going to hit um, that. And then I'll just go ahead and run this. And Gradio has been a little weird lately. OK, so this is still happening. I think it's a Google Chrome thing or a Colab thing. But don't worry, we can actually still see it by clicking on this link. Um, but with Gradio, what we're doing is the same thing we already did before. We're writing up and profiling our prompts and responses. But we kind of built this little interface around it. And so you can click on this local host. And actually, if someone wants to let me know if they ran this code and it rendered in Colab, let me know, because I really liked it when it did that. Um, it's kind of annoying that it's not there, but it's OK. We can still click that link and it'll bring up this little radio app that gives us a little interface here. And now we can type in any message we want and get the response from our, from our GB2 model. And then because we set the YLabs model, it's going to be writing up to YLabs as well. And we have this little um, uh, um, slider here. And we can drag it between 0 and 6. So if I had 0, that's going to write it up for today. 
And if I have it at six, that's going to write it up basically a week ago. So I'm just going to say, hello, GPT, in this first one. Submit it. Someone said the Gradio UI worked for them in Colab. I think when I, I was trying to troubleshoot it, and um, some people said they had similar things with um, with it happening on because of a cookie issue or something like that. And what did I do? Hmm. This just worked for me. So I'm not sure what's going on here. It gave an error. Maybe it's a Gradio thing. I might come back to that in a second. I just, even before the workshop, ran this. So um, let me try it again real quick. See what's going on. Oh, I think in this case, it might be I copied um, over this with a, a space in it. And it's probably trying to write to that model, and then it can't. So. I'm going to go ahead, exit out of that, rerun this again without the space, and let's see what happens. Again, I'm getting the error, but I can open up here. <laughs> everything, someone said, everything always works perfectly before the demo. Right? Demoing live, I don't know why, but uh, something always goes on, right? All right, hopefully this works. Maybe I did a last minute change. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it worked. It was just that I had that space in there. Um, all right, so we did the response and uh, the prompt and response. And now I'm going to write one basically from um, today. So zero is today. This is the amount of days it's going to subtract when we write it up. So if I write in, I love you, hit submit. So if anyone else got that JSON error, it was probably also you had a a space or a new line character in your uh, string. Now, if I go back to Y Labs, I can look at our new project. Oops. All right, yep. Our new project. We have all that telemetry like we had before. Uh, but I'm actually just going to go to this dashboard tab. And we can see, you know, like the sentiment went way up. Uh, because I said, I love you. That's why I was neutral and then all the way up here now. Now I can uh, compare models to each other. So uh, I'll select this batch from these dates. And then I want to compare with the first model, the DSD workshop. And I'll select the same dates again, 18 through 26. And now this kind of gives us some side-by-side -side, um, charts and numbers that we can kind of see how our models are doing. So a quick way to kind of compare, again, like I mentioned, you might want to do this with multiple prompts and then select the best prompt over time. Uh, you could do this basically by running, you know, two prompts on production data and seeing like what the score is for sentiment or toxicity or et cetera, um, and then selecting the best one um, on whatever metric you're measuring for and actually deploy, deploy that to your users. Awesome. I'm going to exit on my Gradio app, but I definitely recommend if you want to kind of play around and see what prompts um, trigger different metrics, definitely play around with this. And again, uh, the GBT model can be a little weird answering stuff. Um, so maybe you want to do something similar, but with the Llama 2 or um, GPT and look at those metrics over time with, with that model. So I'm going to quickly run through the rest of this notebook. We don't have too much left here. Um, and then I'll try to get some questions that I know I probably didn't get to yet. So let's look at how we can do a quick way of validating our prompt or response um, in our local environment here using those metrics that we extract. So again, kind of we've already seen this before. We're importing um, LangKit and LM metrics. I actually don't think we need to import this specific toxicity because it's out of the box uh, included. And then um, we're sending pandas data frame to display all columns. We're going to go ahead and initialize our metrics. Oh, I just did that twice. I could go ahead and delete this code cell. You don't need to run that. And then here we have a really simple function. It's taking in a prompt message. It's just logging the prompt. So like I mentioned, you could just log one or the other. Uh, most of the time, I think people actually just log prompts and responses together. But this is a kind of example where maybe we don't want to pass this toxic prompt to our model um, because maybe it's trying to jailbreak it or something like that. But I would say in production, what most people from what I've seen anyway are actually doing is 
you would probably go ahead past the toxic prompt to your model. But as a guardrail, instead of blocking the prompt going to the model, you'll block the response going to the user. Because you actually might kind of want the data of how did your model respond to that jailbreak or to that uh, toxic prompt. And then just don't give that data to the user, though. So I made this little function. It profiles the data like we did before. And then we access that uh, profile now by turning it into a dictionary. And then we're just uh, looking at this column, prompt.toxicity. You could change this to response.toxicity if you wanted. And then we're just getting the max score in this case. And then we're saying if the max score in this case is just over 0 0.5, uh, return false. And if it's uh, otherwise return true. So is this phrase toxic? Do you like fruit? Uh, the toxic model doesn't think so. It's very low toxicity. Um, here's one that's very toxic is you dumb and smell bad is uh, over 96% uh, toxic. So it's like uh, out of um, basically 100 or one. So again, now we can tie this into how we maybe would use this as a quick guardrail on our model. We're saying is if not toxic, use a prompt. Um, go ahead and now pass that prompt to our model. And we did. It said, do you like fruit? And they said they do. And it's talking about Cheetos. <laughs> and again, the GPT model is a, a really weird and not the most um, consistent or, or useful model. And then here we can say, uh, you dumb and smell bad, very high toxicity. And it blocked it and basically just said, as a large language model, dot, dot, dot. And again, like I was saying in production, a lot of people actually tend to pass the prompt and response in and, and block the response. We also have some other features built into Linkit um, called validators, which is kind of a more advanced way of doing these types of guardrails. Um, you can check out the blog post on that there, or just click the link in the notebook if you're following along. And then like I mentioned, it's actually pretty easy to add custom metrics as well. Um, all you're doing is just importing some custom metric stuff here. We call them a UDF user defined functions. And then you can just write a quick little rule as a function. All you have to do really is have this wrapper around it. And then when you do that LM init again, it's going to include that as a metric. And then you'll see that in your uh, log. And I'll share this blog post as well. And um, we won't run this, but just want to mention optional, you can use a rolling logger. So some people will just want to be kind of collecting batches of all the chats going on and then write them up every five minutes, 10 minutes, et cetera, uh, depending on like how you want to handle basically your, your network traffic. Um, so you can use a rolling logger in Linkit and Y Labs as well. And then here's a whole bunch of other resources. So um, hopefully this kind of got you started, got you thinking about some metrics to maybe monitor um, models in production or for evaluation. There's a lot more examples on the Linkit uh, GitHub repo. There's the intro to Linkit. We have the integration with Linkit and LangChain you can check out. Um, another one on Hugging Face, but we just ran this today. Uh, but you can check out everything on GitHub for open source stuff. Check out more on Y Labs. Um, and then also there's the link for the promo code down here as well if you want to check out any more of the kind of enterprise features in Y Labs. But with that, that's all um, the content I have to run through. Um, we might have a little bit of time for questions. I'm not sure, Nathan, how, how you are on your side. Um, we're a little over time, but I think, like, I don't know what you have going on after this, but if uh, maybe we can answer a couple questions and then call it a day. Yeah, I'll answer a couple here. If I didn't get to them, um, connect with me on LinkedIn if you actually want them answered. And also, uh, there's the Slack channel as well. If you want to join and ask any questions about this stuff later, uh, please let me know. Yeah, because I think there's quite a few. I probably won't be able to get to all of them. So I apologize. Um, and because we're over time. Um, someone said, how do we define these metrics like readability, et cetera? Um, so a lot of these, you can go look at the open source tool itself and see exactly which models are behind the scene. Um, so some of them are really lightweight, like you might have seen before, like NLTK models. That's how like the sentiment one is tracked, for example. Uh, we're looking always at bringing in better ones or more improved ones and doing some research ourselves for creating things like the prompt and response similarity, et cetera. Uh, but again, a lot of people can also bring in their own um, custom metrics. So hopefully the out of the box ones are a cool place to start and give you kind of like some insight on your data. Um, but then you might develop a custom metric that you're like, this is the really the gold standard that I want to monitor for.
Justin said, it seems like for many LM projects, the LM output is also the main application output. But what if you want to create prompts that give output in set pattern so it can be interpreted by code in a larger application? I use large language models to extract insights from natural text that can be used for other purposes. Can this be used to ensure that the LM output follows the desired pattern? Great question. So I think you could do that. Um, you could probably create, for example, maybe it's regex or something like that as a custom metric and then um, log like basically yes or no, or you could have some sort of similarity score to that pattern you're looking for. But I assume in this case, you always want it uh, one single pattern. And it should always look that way. I think you could probably do that uh, with regex and a custom function. Great question. It's a, a cool use case. <laughs> Someone asked if I could try a sarcastic comment. Um, if you're following along, you totally can. Um, I won't do that right now, just as we're kind of wrapping up. But it was always fun to pass in different stuff to your uh, large language model. Um, someone said, can we see the toxic, the not toxic function in more detail? Yeah, and also, um, hopefully, you have this link to the notebook um, if you're following along. And um, you can can look at it there. And I'll grab that link one more time. If you want to dive deeper into anything that I showed, um, everything is in that notebook, and you can go ahead and look at it. Someone said, is there a plan to monitor drifts of text embedding? So if you have that as a score, um, and we we do have a blog post on that, actually, um, on, y, on uh, y Labs that is monitoring embeddings at scale, whether that's text or computer vision. Um, you you can uh, do that. You just have to get the data in the right format. But yeah, great question. All right, Sage, I think that just about does it for us.